Hello. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Creative Reaction Session of Point of Science 2021. I am your host, Teja, and traditionally, we'd be in an exhibition space in Cambridge, but we've had to adapt, and it's really good to have you all join us virtually tonight. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. Creative Reactions is the sister festival to Point of Science, and born here in Cambridge, it involves the one-to-one -one pairing of local artists with scientists who have participated in Point of Science. The artists are introduced to the speakers and are encouraged to participate in a creative exercise with them. The resulting artwork is exhibited online throughout May in the link that was just shown. <laughs> Our talks today will be there. That's the exhibition link. Uh, our talks today will be on exploring biomes, both in the world around us and in our own bodies. We have five local artists talking to us about their work. Tina Burton and Jenny Turtle are presenting their work in response to the Pint of Science Planet Earth session. They were matched with scientists Ellie Bladen, Chris Sandbrook, and Hugh Hunt. Chris and Hugh are climate scientists, and Ellie works on parenting behavior in burying beetles. We will then have a Q&A session where you can ask Tina and Jenny about their work. After that, we will be joined by Jackie Duckworth, John Hodson, and Kate Grant, who were matched with scientists Rob Finn and Pippa Corey. Pippa is a cancer research scientist, and Rob studies the human microbiome. We will then have a Q&A with them. And in the meantime, we would love to get the conversation started with you. So let us know in the chat box on your screen where you're tuning in from today and whether you've attended a previous Creative Reactions exhibition or not. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first artist tonight, Tina Burton. Tina is a Cambridge-based artist and lecturer who works with scientists to create artistic responses to their cutting edge research. Her current focus is an exploration of attention over time, space, and matter through walking. The repetitive labor of step after step, one foot after the other, has left traces throughout her work in numerous ways. Tina's work has been collected and exhibited internationally, and she has published two books of fine art photography. And now I will let Tina take over and tell us about her work titled Samples Imagine Possible Futures. Hello, and thank you, Tasia. And thank you all for inviting me here tonight to talk about my artwork. This is the sixth year that I'm taking part in Pint of Science Creative Reactions. And in the past, I've been matched with scientists studying a really wide range of fascinating subjects from robotic hands to artificial consciousness and more. My piece this year is a video created in response to Dr. Hugh Hunt's research into solar radiation management and stratospheric particle injection for climate engineering. I have to admit not knowing anything about this topic to start with, so I had to get up to speed quite fast. Hugh helpfully talked to us about his work and gave us some research sources to delve into. I learned that climate or geoengineering covers a multitude of scientific fields, from carbon capture and ocean deacidification to the melting of ice in the polar regions, and Hugh's specific focus on solar radiation management, amongst many others. It's a complicated web of entangled systems where small changes can have an unexpected knock-on effect elsewhere, making it difficult to know which path is the best one to choose. Carbon by itself is not a terrible thing. We wouldn't exist without it. Humans, however, have been pumping gigatons of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere every year, upsetting the climate balance and causing dramatic and untold effects. We need to repair our climate for our planet to be habitable for many species, not just humans. So solar radiation management is just one part of the puzzle where the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth is altered on a local or global scale to promote climate cooling. One method of doing this might be to release particles into the upper atmosphere, which reflects sunlight back out to space, mimicking the effect of large volcanic eruptions um, in lowering the average global temperature, but without the lava. Of course, this is not without its downsides, including the cost of continuous upkeep 
and the pollution caused by particles slowly falling back to Earth over time. I'm definitely not an expert after a month of research, so rather than trying to give you any answers with this artwork I've been, that's been showing behind us now, um, I hope to prompt further questions instead. Some of the questions that have come up for me are, um, at what point does climate change become severe enough that we need to take really drastic action on a global scale? And who gets to decide what happens and when? Who will this affect the most and who will speak up for them? Is something like solar geoengineering a direction we even want to consider for the future? And what happens if it's too late? One of the things that struck me was that the path we take now alters the possibilities available to us, hence the title of the piece, Samples Imagine Possible Futures. If research into solar geoengineering isn't started now, it won't be ready just in case it's needed to hold off a climate emergency. If it is started now, the idea that we have a backup plan might be used to prolong other harmful practices towards the climate. So who decides? Whilst researching this topic, thoughts of particle clouds, of dancing solar winds, of sediment abandoned by retreating glaciers went through my mind, from these minute specks of dust to a macro view of the changing landscape from high above. I tried out a few different techniques to explore this feeling before coming across a type of cameraless photography invented in the 1930s called cliché vert. This technique uses glass plates covered in carbon soot or opaque paint, which are then scratched or drawn into to create a negative image. Light is then shone through them onto photographic paper. Then the paper is developed and fixed with photographic chemicals. The more light that gets through to the paper, the darker the image becomes. So um, in my pseudo scientific way, um, I collected my own samples, here we go, um, of um, carbon and other traces by holding um, glass microscope slides over a candle to collect the soot from it here. Um, this one's taking, this candle's not giving off a huge amount of soot, which is great for the environment. Um, and then I used these um, as negatives to then um, draw into and make more marks with um, and use those in my enlarger in my darkroom. So um, I tried lots of different experiments in my darkroom to see which slides printed well, um, and then scanned the prints in and chose a selection for the final video piece. Um, I find it's always a fascinating challenge to respond creatively to someone else's research. And Hugh's topic has really opened my eyes to some of the details of climate change that were unknown to me. This way of working helps me find out things that I didn't know I was missing out on and investigate them further. So I really hope you've enjoyed my little snippet of my artwork this evening. And if you have any questions for me, you're welcome to add them into the chat. If you'd like to see more of my work, please visit my website, tinaburton.co.uk. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening, Tina. I particularly enjoyed the little demonstration. It actually made so much more sense. Um, thank you once again, and we'll see you shortly for the Q&A. So we're now going to move on to our second artist for the evening. We have Jenny Turtle, who has completed a mixed media degree in Brighton and specializes in jewelry and sculpture. She works in silver and bronze combined with steel, fossils, and rough stones. She loves texture and specializes in cuttlefish casting. Recently, she has been making larger, more sculptural pieces for the garden in forged steel and bronze. Today, we will be hearing about Jenny's piece called Beautiful Beetles. Hello, lovely to see you all. Thank you for being with me tonight. I just want to tell you that I have been reacting to Ellie Baldwin's project where she is studying the parental habits of beetles. Now this is quite an unusual thing for me to be doing but I've really enjoyed the challenge and when I listened to what she was saying I thought well I want to do something with a different connection of textures. So I used this stone here 
um, to carve the different areas for the environment for the beetles. And then I made a lot of little different um, brass beetles with etched lines on them here and oxidized them so that the contrast showed quite well. And I learned from Ellie that, in fact, the most important part of the beetle's life was the food ball, which you can imagine is inside here. And so I made the two little nests for the food ball and then put the beetles around that. The other thing that she does is she has these beetles that protect the food ball and they are the um the fathers in the family which are very important and so they all round the edges of each bit of nest where the stone is carved so this was my big project and i really enjoyed doing it it was um fascinating to hear how important the behavior of beetles is to learn about our society today and i think what she's doing is very interesting so it was a good project for me to do. It was great. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And I think it was very good that the Pint of Science people in Cambridge have thought up this idea so that we can share ideas and find new projects and things. You can see here in this slide that this is the detail of the actual food ball, which is in fact made of clay with feathers and meat and bones and things which the beetles actually eat inside. And the rest of the, the stone is covered in little beetles which walk around together in groups because she's learning a lot about how the groups of beetles work together. And so that's why they're all in together on the, on the actual stone carving. So thank you very much for watching and it was a really great project to do. Cheers. Thank you for that, Jenny. That was really interesting to see your piece of work. Um, well, if we have any questions, we can get Jenny and Tina up, some Q and A's. We have a question from Shana Pode. Thanks, Shana. Shana says, I'm curious what insights the artists have as they are representing the scientists' research in physical and visual form. Would either of you like to answer that? I'll go for it. Um, for me, it's always taking my own view on it, doing my own research into their work and um, kind of finding a way to get through it without necessarily kind of just taking the scientist's work into account. So often I will make my own samples and um, or do things in an analog way um, to find my own way through it. Following on from that, I have a question actually for you, Tina. What, what, how did you decide to take the cameraless photography path for this particular piece instead of something else? Well, at first I tried with um, some 3D animation software and I was doing these clouds of particles and they were moving and it was going to be animated. But then I read about this, this cliche vert technique is really old. It was like at the dawn of photography before they had um, photographic film. So, um, the actual thought of collecting carbon, um, I found really interesting. And the process of them doing that in the darkroom and seeing these prints kind of magically appear out of the chemicals is always amazing to me. That's awesome, thank you. Jenny, uh, I have a question for you. How did you get the beetles all shiny? Like they're, they're just like your eyes completely are drawn in. <laughs> That's really fantastic. Well, I etched them with um, the fine lines on the beetles and etching is where you paint a design on the, on the metal with varnish and then put it in a great big tub of acid and the acid will eat around your design so it stays shiny in the areas that aren't being eaten and so that shines up and then I put oxide over the whole thing so you had a combination between the dark and the light areas and highly polished it yeah 
that was the one thing that I really enjoyed doing was finding this contrast between textures and between the special quality of the beetles and the rough quality of the stone. Yeah. That's incredible. We have another question for Tina from Making Strangers. How did you make the images with the crystals effect? Ah, I think I know which one. So there's lots of kind of different sorts of particles my scientist was talking about, not just carbon, but he was also talking about they spraying salt into the atmosphere and all sorts of things. So um, on different slides, I tried different things and I actually dipped some of them in kind of salty liquid. Um, and then um, when I put that into the enlarger, you could really see the crystals and it was amazing. So they're, they're salt crystals. Sweet. We have another question from Becky Gregory. What were the most interesting things you learned during the project, both scientifically and within your own crafts? I can, I, think, I can have a go, but Jenny, go for it. I think the thing for me was that it just takes you out of your comfort zone. I've never done anything like this particularly before and related my work to a scientific experiment, or whatever, and it was actually very good to do that. I think it's quite fun that we can actually get inspiration in these projects. And for me, it pushes me to find different techniques to go with the um, different work. Each year it's something completely, we, we get assigned like a random scientist. We don't know beforehand what we're going to be given necessarily. So um, to kind of have to think on your feet and respond to this um, is always a lot of fun and um, a good challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, and if there aren't any more questions, I'd just like to thank you once again for your participation this year. Um, and we've loved thank your work. Thank you so much, Taya. Yeah, thank you. We enjoyed it. <laughs> well, it's now time to move to part two of our evening, where we have three artists joining us and presenting their art in response to Pippa Corey and Rob Finn's research. Jackie Duckworth is our first artist this evening. Well, first artist for part two. Uh, her first career was in genetics, but in 2000, she switched her allegiance to art, studying illustration at Angli Ruskin and becoming a printmaker and illustrator. History and legend are favorite themes in her work, but she loves the challenge posed by more unusual subjects. She has participated in Creative Reactions since 2017 and enjoys working outside of her comfort zone. She's a member of the Cambridge Open Studios and Cambridge Drawing Society and has been exhibited across the UK in Dublin and in Helsinki. And now on to Jackie to hear about her piece, Percent and Perceive. Hello, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, yeah. So... I've been doing um, creative reactions for several years, as uh, as Tasia mentioned. I thought I'd just show you quickly the things that I'd done in the previous years, just to, so you can see the kind of variation that we can we can explore in these projects. So this was um, a my scientist was researching the effect of maternal diet on the health of the children. So I made these cyanotypes, which are kind of primitive photographs. Um, with uh, Rubens women and babies and sweets in the background. Then this one, I actually was working with a scientist who was exploring errors in DNA replication. So I put my printmaker's, printmaker's hat on and did a piece of work which involved both a, a print and the printing plate. And there's a photograph of the printing press. And then there's the little books that kind of fall apart as you look at them. And then in 2019, I was assigned a senior academic at the British Antarctic Survey. And this is a 3D mixed media piece which celebrates his, his long career and has, it has a little silver button uh, at Headland Peak, which is named after him. So this year I was assigned Dr. Pippa Corrie. And 
I was really excited by this for two reasons. One is that when I was before 2000, when I was a, a scientist, one of the things I did was work for the Leukemia Research Fund on the genetics of leukemia. So I kind of have a bit of a background in clinical trials and things already. The other thing was it was quite personal because a friend of mine is actually on an immunotherapy trial, so for a, not the same cancer as Dr. as Dr. Corey works with. So that was something that was already kind of going around in my mind. And as I was listening to, to, to Pippa explaining what she was doing, reading the material she sent us, one of the things that really struck me was that for the scientist, it's all about percentages. It's all about um, increasing the percentage of, of cures a little bit, um, decreasing percentage of, of side effects, which is what Dr. Corey is particularly working on at the moment. But for my friend, for the patient, it's rather different. Don't worry whether your chances are 5% or 15%. It doesn't matter as long as you are in the right percentage. So the choices are closing down. You, you're going from being one of these many, many people to being a singular person taking a path that may or may not work for you. And that's the only, once you've stepped onto that path, the, the percentages kind of go away, if that makes sense. So I started off thinking about these journeys and the uncertainty and, and decision making. And I started off with people on stepping stones, um, which was, you know, I was I was quite enjoying drawing people on stepping stones. But then I wanted to also include some of the actual figures that, that, that Dr. Corey's research has in it. So um, I was taking the graphs and I was tracing over the graphs on my on my iPad and making various curves and shapes. But when I put them together with the figures, it didn't work because you can't have they look like hills and, and, and undulating landscapes. But the people are on water. That just didn't work at all for me. So I took away the water. Um, and in this experiment, I actually just gave up on the curves and I had instead a kind of path of bacteria because her work is on the microbiome, um, like a part, but I didn't like that. And I put the curves in, uh, back in again, and I like that, but I still didn't like the bacteria. So I was kind of homing in on what I wanted to do with the people and the curves and, and layers of transparency. The technique I decided to use was um, gelatin printing. This is a very handy and easy way to do gelatin printing without mucking about making baths of, of, of gelatin to do your printmaking. Um, this is something I've done quite a lot of recently, but I've done a lot of very small pieces and I thought it'd be really interesting to try and make bigger pieces um, for, for this kind of science this year. So that was my kind of aim. Now I've got a video here of um, printing dragons, which I, which I made. So I thought I'd talk you through that a bit. So you use stencils cut out of card or, or anything that will make a shape or a texture. You put the ink on the plate and then you just rub it on. Because I was using a big piece of paper compared to the plate, I did quite a lot of this technique where I'd flip it over in order to get the plate on exactly the right position that I wanted it on the paper. And each time you peel it back, it's a surprise, which is always fun. You never know quite what you're gonna get. Um, and one technique I did use, and I'll show you the detail of that in a bit, is to do printing on special tissue paper that's very strong. Um, and then you get a beautiful transparent sheet with some printing on it. And if you glue it down, the sheet itself kind of melts away, but you've still got the print. So it adds to the, the whole multi-layered effect. But you do get very gluey, as you can see here. So that was the final piece for that, that particular collage. Um, so here we have, moving on to the finished pieces, I'm just gonna show you some of the details. So you can see here, I've just drawn, scribbled on the lines. Um, and when they go away, in a moment, you can see that the, um, the curves from the, the, the science graphs are there, but they're kind of quite subtle. 
I also wanted to put some details on, particularly um, because I was thinking this whole percentages thing. So I had some, I've got a digital cutter and I cut little tiny percentage signs out of card. And then I tried using that to print directly onto the actual piece that I'd made, but the paper was too thick. So I went switch to the other technique and I printed it onto the uh, lens tissue, <coughs> excuse me. And then I could glue it onto the onto the um, the piece of art and the paper just disappears and you just get left with the little marks. And similarly, I had some um, pieces of card that already had things cut out of them from a previous project and some of the like the little scraps from it. So I also used those and printed them onto tissue and scattered them on tissue, and put a bit of ink on and then layered them on top of my people and graphs picture until I got the right level of detail that I wanted. And then finally, I put it all on one side for a couple of days and then came back to my pieces and just brought out some of the details with watercolor pencil, which works really well because it's a similar texture. I then decided the one on the right I didn't like. So I came down with these two pieces that I chose for to, re to represent my ideas for creative reaction, which are called perceive from the patient's point of view and percent from the scientist's point of view. Um, do have a look at my website and I'm also going to plug Cambridge Open Studios, which hopefully is running this year. Lots of us are exhibiting in our gardens and things like that. So it will be safe and hopefully people will come and see us. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for that, Jackie. Um, I really enjoyed watching you sort of layer your piece as it were, um, sort of see what you, mm. what, what you connected with and what worked and what didn't mm. work. That was super interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll see you in the Q&A shortly. Right, so we move on next to John Hudson, our second Our Body artist. John is an artist of the spoken word, spoken and written word who aims to communicate science on a shared elevated plane. The qualities of the unknown imbue the scientific mind with a necessarily narrow perspective that is as alien as Kyrgyzstan and as difficult to visit. He floats across many foreign lands by air balloon, drawing pictures with clumsy words and hinting at signs as a familiar experience. Apprenticed in arcane microbiology, he likes to get his head inside a subject and lick out odd crusty bits. Given time, the digested fragments re-emerge as poems, spoken thought, audio outlines, and word-based graphics. In his sculpture, he says, he is driven by materials and value for money. His art is driven by words, data, and a belief that most of what we see in the world is colored by ancient myths, faith, and an idea that, and ideas that have been superseded by knowledge. I will not let John take over and tell us all about his artwork. Thanks, Teja. So I'm going to hopefully share this. Can you see that? Okay, is that? Yeah. So I'm John Hodgson, and uh, these are the five works that I've got in Pinder Science uh, Creative Reactions this year, and uh, they're largely related. And I'll get straight on to the background. So. I was paired with Rob Finn, who's at the uh, Emble Institute, the Wellcome Institute, uh, doing basically genomics. And his particular speciality is the genomics of the gut or the, the bacteria inside the gut. So one of the things I like about Pine Science is you get filled with mind blowing knowledge. It doesn't matter whether it's a subject that's somewhat familiar to you, like this is for me, because uh, I'm a microbiologist too, or something entirely different. Um, the mind-blowing bits of information from Rob were that there's an, a kind of a universe inside us. We're talking about um, the colon, the gut, uh, and that number there is 50 trillion, um, which is 50 million million bacteria in our colon. So that's a population that lives inside us, lives and dies to some extent. And that's more bacteria inside us than there are human cells outside the bacteria. Um, and Rob's project uh, in particular was dealing with, uh, a, as it were, a library or at least a collection of samples of feces from people all around the world. Um, and 
the way that Rob was analyzing this was not to take all, all the original samples, but to take the sequences, genetic sequences of the microbial flora of the bacteria from within the samples. And in fact, his project was really collecting that from other people that had collected it um, and then analyzing it and seeing how many different kinds of bacteria we can find if we look across that whole set of uh, 280,000 samples. And one of the, the numbers that he came up with was, was that there are about 50,000 different, no, not, uh, 5,000 different types of bacteria that they uh, cataloged. And 70% of those were not known before they'd looked. And, that, and the reason for that was because mo most of the bacteria in the gut um, are anaerobic, which means they don't like oxygen. So as soon as you start to take them outside of the fecal sample or poo, as we may call it, um, they die and it's too tricky to cultivate them in the lab. So they were not known. Um, Ro also had some messages that um, he, he thought he'd like to pass on. And one of those was that things like Yakult don't really work, or it is, at least if they do work, you only need to buy Yakult once because if it changes your gut flora, which is what it claims to do, it's done. The second message, which is somewhat controversial, is that the new technique of fecal transfer which is the replacement of uh, of gut bacteria to try and cure other diseases may have mysterious dangers because we don't know what 70 percent of the bacteria are in it and the other message which i thought was particularly interesting is that compared to the differences in the genetics of our poo you and i are clones we're all exactly similar compared to the huge differences that there are between our poo so fingerprints are one thing poo prints are possibly another my approach is to try and get inside the science, but also to get inside the heads of the scientists who are, are, are telling us about this. I like to be able to picture what's going on with the science and picture what's going on in their heads when they're doing it. I'm particularly interested in the knowledge deficit, meaning you know what we know and what we don't know. Um, so usually a scientific paper describes things that we know and the things that we don't know are just kind of understood. So what they haven't looked at um, is, is interesting to me. Um, and then looking at what extra information we might need to understand things better and how we could get to that. Um, I also like to find a bit of humor if I can. And with this topic, that's probably quite easy. Uh, my process, personally, uh, when I'm making, so the background to this slide is an example of one of the graphics that I make. Um, it it's tends to be driven by numbers. I like to take the data from, from the scientific papers and make it make a, a, a picture for me. Um, that is somehow relevant to the subject. And often I might try and think, I might think that I'm going very deep, um, but I'm probably being entirely shallow. And one of the techniques that I use and that I've used for this uh, creative reaction is uh, an infographics program called Tableau. In other words, I'm using the tools that scientists use to show their data. Um, the first, the, the way I thought about this, my wife's just walked into the room, so I'm a little nervous now, um, it is to look at some of the uh, shapes and symbols that might be associated with uh, 280,000 uh, samples of poo. And um, so I started exploring a few shapes um, and I managed to write e equations to make these kind of spirals uh, out of a repeated shape. And you can see that we're starting to get into the, to the world of poo a, a little bit. Um, uh, but there are variants on a theme, and that's what I really like to juggle with. Um, so uh, the, the second part of the equation, really, for me, is to put symbols into, to construct the symbols that make up that infographic. So in, in Tableau, you don't have to just take the squares and triangles and circles that they provide. You can make your own symbols. And these are some of the examples. Uh, that's the very handsome Rob Finn there, and a copy of Rob Finn that became a symbol, as you'll see. So, moving swiftly on to my pieces. This is a set of four pieces, um, which, as you can see, are kind of, you know, you could look at them as various uh, uh, representations of 
the subject of the paper or, or as a dirty protest that uh, Rob Finn has uh, executed at the Wellcome uh, Laboratory facilities. Um, but I see them in a bit more detail than that, and we're going to look at it in a bit more detail now. So this one I call the plan. Um, it's sort of a random arrangement of thoughts. Uh, I've used the, the Rob Finn symbol. In fact, I've used it throughout this set, apart from uh, one last, uh, the last uh, item. And this is meant to be a kind of depiction of the early stage of thinking about the process. It's not entirely organized. It's getting there, but there's still some loose ends and some things that don't really make much sense. This one I call strain. Now, in uh, the topic area of 280,000 uh, samples of poo, strain has a number of meanings. And obviously, with Rob's research, strain can mean the microbial strains uh, in the context of this project. It can mean the act of expulsion. Um, you know, I like to think of it as my artistic process that uh, something is happening here to to extrude uh, a, a picture like this but when we superimpose rob's face onto the picture there's also an element of um the scream about this picture i feel and and since there's um discussion between both ends of this picture i think that that's the strain in organizing this huge project uh, ac across the globe um and then there's the mental strain that um that comes with that um exercise ultimately though working through that process uh, you get a beautiful vision and this is the the third piece and um you know everything has come together at this point it looks very organized it looks quite to me uh, quite uh uh not like uh, the original sample matter and um you perhaps reminiscent of flowers and, and other fragrances that you might associate with your own personal relationship with with the subject matter um and then but the final piece in this series is i've called festival and that's essentially because it reminds me that ultimately all the samples came from people um and this represents probably the biggest queue for the loo that you've ever seen uh, outside Glastonbury. Just to put Rob's figure of 280,000 uh, samples into context, Glastonbury produces about twice as much uh, samples, but they don't process them as, as neatly as he does. Um, it also remind us, reminds us that, you know, inside the poo are little organisms. It, in, this is a reversal of the actual situation, of course, where the microbes are usually inside and the people are on the outside. Here, the people are inside the, the, the sample. Now, this wasn't entirely satisfactory to me because in Rob's project, and as he's mentioned in his talk, uh, those, the origins of those 280,000 samples are very unevenly spread around the world. There are about 50,000 each from China and USA, as you might expect from big countries. But I looked at a, a, a parameter that I call turds per million people. And for some reason, uh, the distribution in some countries was very high and in some countries very low. So in Fuji, uh, Fiji, that should, should say Fiji, um, 12,000 per million people. In Denmark, also quite high numbers. Sweden, quite high numbers. But in the UK, only 200 poos donated per million people uh, in the UK. And in some countries, there's only one per country. And in many countries that I've called the Sherlock's, uh, there are no samples whatsoever. Um, so in Ethiopia, Congo, Turkey, these are big places that there's no, there are no samples. So. It, Whatever the, rep the database of, 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 of poo samples represents, um, it's not a, a, a universal or a geographical or a global um, sample. Uh, there's a lot of stuff from old people and babies and not much from middle-aged people. And nearly half the stuff comes from sick people. So what I wanted to sort of represent that. And, and that's in the final piece, uh, which I call perturbation because this is a perturbed ratio. And what I've tried to do here is not draw attention to those 
is draw attention to those places with very few samples. Um, and I've organized it by continent, and I'll, I can just talk you through that briefly. But essentially, wherever you see a wherever you see a dot, that's that's a turd. There are two hundred eighty thousand of them in this piece, and they're divided by continent. And the bigger the the dot, as you can see, the dot is a, a person symbol. Um, the bigger the dot, the fewer there are. So this is a kind of infographic to help Rob Finn and his colleagues um, reach out, as it were, for more samples. Um, in fact, I could have named this piece the defecation deficit, um, but I'll, I'll stick with perturbation for now. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me drivel on. And I'll speak to you later. Thank you so much for that, John. That was fascinating. Um, I also loved how your work not only included the science, but so much of the scientist as well. What a lovely homage. I'm sure he appreciates that. <laughs> Hopefully he will, yes. <laughs> Thanks again. And we'll see you for Q&A shortly. So our last artist speaker this evening is Kate Grant. Dr. Kate Grant is a GP and artist, and this is the sixth year she has collaborated with Pint of Science. She uses resin to create her pieces, combining an understanding of histology and microbiology to recreate fantastical interpretations of the processes in the human body. She loves to explore the unpredictable outcomes of working with a complex and uncontrollable medium, and the results look like something you could imagine under a microscope, but with a twist. This last year has seen Kate creating a series of over 50 portraits of her NHS colleagues, both in primary care and the emergency department at Norfolk and Norwich Hospital, plus several other hospitals in South Wales that were worst hit by the pandemic early on. Kate participated in the Cambridge Science Festival this year and is also a producer and illustrator for a medical podcast called The Curbsiders. Today, Kate will be talking to us about her piece, Extending Time. Hi, Tia. Thanks for welcoming me onto the show. It's uh, really lovely to see a couple of my other artist colleagues as well, because we often find that we all um, see each other every year. And uh, this is, like I said, it's my sixth year, same as um, Tina and Jackie. So that's a lot of fun. Um, so this year I was paired with Pippa Corrie and um, she's a consultant oncologist at Adam Brooks and she researches malignant melanoma and treatments. So she um, does like to explain that there are sort of currently four mainstays of treatment for malignant melanoma that the three are usually more familiar. So, you know, surgical treatment, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and this new emerging area of immunotherapy is now becoming really important. And the group of people that she finds herself researching now are people who are towards the end of stage of disease who maybe have currently only been given a prognosis of about a year. So she did talk about how difficult that was um, you know, getting to know the patients and their families when they know that their um, disease is very advanced. And so the treatments that are available to them have to be pretty special. And trying to, like Jackie was saying earlier, trying to find something that increases that percentage improvement in their condition and extends their life. Um, it, it's, it's a big difference to these people in the last stages. So, um, you know, are, are there things that you can identify in themselves and the treatment that um, make, makes a difference. So she um, is researching the microbiome and the impact of your own gut flora on how you respond to treatment. And um, it's quite a personal journey, I think, for Dr. Corrie as well as her patients, because she does get to know them and the families. And, and that's something different that I found this year compared to some of the previous years when I've collaborated with the scientists is that this time it's with, you know, face to face with you know patients not just you know in a lab somewhere where you're not sure what research is going to have an impact on a clinical treatment later down the line um so uh she wanted to know do some of the um gut bacteria that 
one person has, will that make them respond better to an immunotherapy compared to somebody else who's got a different type of gut bacteria? And like John was saying, it's multitudinous numbers of bacteria, some of which we don't even know. So Dr. Corrie was saying that her research um, was taking samples of people who are being treated um, for uh, malignant melanoma with immunotherapies. Um, they, they separate the poo out into the different types of bacteria. And then they say, well, you know, if this person has got this type of um, profile of bacteria and the other person's got another profile, which bacteria can you identify? And does that then give you an idea of, well, if we gave the non-responder some bacteria from a responder, would it change their outcome? Um, she doesn't have that answer yet, but... Um, you, they they are seeing some you know some some data that is showing that you can tell who's going to respond and, and that that is giving them more ideas for where they take their research further so um you know we know that the human body is a big ecosystem it's filled with microbes and you know it's for digesting food and there's other functions like pathogen resistance and immune um development and, and response to treatments and so on so um you know i think um um, what I was going to say, um, some patients have found that their life expectancy does extend further. And so, this, so I've got some slides coming up now just to show you where I sort of just took my thoughts. So um, I, like Atea said, I use um, a resin uh, in, in my art a lot, especially when I'm sort of interpreting um, the scientific data. So here we've got a malignant melanoma on the left. And then I um, basically created my own melanoma on, on a piece of um, crackle glaze. And I was originally going to start with um, three three different um, pieces, like I've done multiple pieces in previous years. And um, so uh, you can move on. And uh, I, I sort of magnified the skin and I, I, I sort of looked at it and it just looks like something from the Mars landing. And I, I realized that I could create it with um, some, some crackle glaze and this stuff where's my camera this is like a crackle paste and it's like a really thick sort of substrate that you can spread onto your medium and as it dries out it just falls forces these deep deep caverns and then I just use that to paint onto and um, I used um, three different um, images one was like cross-section of the gut so here's the colon with its wonderful um, you know high surface area in the center and then the immune areas um, of called payers patches where the immune response comes from my third piece was sort of these ideas of concentric circles with the one year of prognosis extending to two years and three years as people respond better to their um, treatment. Now what went wrong with my project at this point was I was trying to straighten one of these boards out and I actually broke it in half and um, I, I suddenly had a, a bit of inspiration. I broke all of them apart and I put them randomly onto you know a larger board and I suddenly realized that I was able to combine the ideas of the gut and the flora and the microbiology and the horrible you know malignant melanoma and so on and I, I, I sort of did all of that and then I poured some resin onto the top of um, this substrate. I, I really like that view actually um, and then I in the resin, I incorporated some, uh, you know, some colors and I started making cellular shapes to represent the cells of the body, um, the immune response. And I even recreated my own different types of bacteria that Dr. Corrie sort of researches. So there's the bifidobacterium with its branching structures, E. coli, which is one of my favorites. And I created my own version of that and um, some lactobacilli. And I also showed some um, antibodies and antigen presenting cells, which of course come from you know that is part of the immune response and you know after a few layers of extra resin I, I came up with my final piece um, which was called extending time because that was the thing that was left to be most impressed upon me by Dr Corey's research was just extending the time that the patients are with us and um, how, what a personal journey it is for Dr Corey. Um, if you want to see this piece and my other NHS portraits, the series from the last year, you can go to um, my website, which is www.kategrantart.com. And uh, very happy to show you some stuff there as well. Thank you.
you so much for that, Kate. Uh, I loved how you've used color and texture so much. Like it, it's, it's almost like you can feel the inside of the human microbiome. That was fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Right, it's time for Q&A again. And we now have John, Kate and Jackie up. Ah, we have our first question from Shona. Do you communicate with the scientists during the creating process? Yes. Yeah, we, we, um, we often, we tend, we get, when we get paired up, we um, get, uh, we t well, I mean, this year we did a WhatsApp group, didn't we, um, Jackie? And um, we uh, have a like a Zoom call and we swap papers. I mean, we, we ask for um, are there abstracts, uh, any images and graphs. And that's what, you know, I think I like the visuals to see what, what visuals they're taking into their research. And, and uh, you were able to use them for you, weren't you, Jackie? And I was able to mm -hmm. take some, you know, these ideas of pillars and skin and, you know, photographs and melanomas and things. So that I found that very helpful. It's quite stimulating. It's even better when you can go for coffee, but never mind. <laughs> We have a question for Jackie from Becky Gregory. As a scientist previously, do you think science and art overlap? And can we do more to utilize the creative process of artists to help inspire the science that we do? I think that there is a lot that science could learn from art. Um, I think that it's there's a perception that art isn't important and i think that art is very important and i think that art in general um has its place as a very important thing in the world and we should value that and i think that this kind of project actually emphasizes that the way that that, that we can we can communicate and show things um, um does that make sense I don't know if it makes yeah. sense or not, but I, I feel quite strongly about it anyway. Yeah, it does. Um, we have another question from Phil Bell Young. I find this area so interesting. Is art the new best way to teach or raise awareness on topics in science? I think it could be a very good way to engage people who maybe wouldn't normally... No, no, normally, I, I think you could go both ways. You could use the art to engage people who are interested in art in the science, and you can use it the other way around to it, to engage people who are mostly interested in science in the arts. I think the the crossing over is of enormous value. I think as well, you know, I I've noticed, and you'll have seen this as well, Jackie. When people have come to the live exhibitions, you know, in previous years, that you know. They, they look at things at face value and just appreciate the artistic work and they like the colours or the shapes. And then when you start explaining what it means, they're drawn in and it takes them to a completely different different plane. And I've certainly found with my stuff, you know, it's quite biolog biological. And I say, well, this is what a colon looks like. That's what a bacteria looks like. It's what different cells in the body look like. And and you explain that they actually do look like that under the microscope, um, different colours and immunofluorescent stains. And, and I think people, it just opens their eyes and they, they appreciate their bodies a bit more. Awesome. Anna says, as an artist with zero artistic ability, I really enjoyed seeing and hearing your interpretation of the project. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, I feel the same too. <laughs> I feel like I've learned so much just from hearing you guys. Um, we have another question. Phil says, what has been your most rewarding experience whilst communicating science using art? I'm just going to jump in quickly and say that as a GP, I, I have a stack of paper on my desk and almost everybody that comes in is such a shortcut for me just to sketch out a quick diagram of the kidney or a slip disc or a tendon or something. And, and the, the immediate understanding of what's going on, I, I love that. And most of the time I have to rip bits of my paper off and send it home with them because they want to tell their husband what's wrong or whatever it is. And so that, that's very useful. Um, I, I find that personally rewarding. Am I supposed to be talking now? Just nod if that's correct. Go for it, John. Go for so it. So my, my most rewarding, I, I can't hear what anybody's saying, so my most rewarding experience is basically every time I go into planet science, I know that I'm kind of working at the edge. 
not you know of my knowledge obviously but um i'm working with scientists who are also working at the edge and that means that part of what they probably do is uh based in reality and part of what they do is based in the fantasy of a theory and so we go with them on that journey into this kind of moonlit world of reality bridging into to fantasy and some of the speculations that you can make uh, based on you know current knowledge and going into the future are, are just totally ridiculous when you've made that journey and you look back and say well no that's not the place to go so you discount that theory but working at the edge of knowledge is always fascinating and I, I think it always uh, a, a useful exercise in stretching your imagination to at least the edge of reality and, and perhaps not too far beyond yeah we have another question from phil what would be your advice to an artist who wants to get more involved in science communication with their work you can contact them on um pintofscience.com there's a contact me um section and, and they'll be able to get in touch with us and we can um tag, tag you for next year's uh, creative reactions can't we welcome welcome to the world of weirdness <laughs> Well, thank you so much, all of you, for sharing your art with us this evening. It's been absolutely fantastic seeing your inspiration um, and seeing how your art develops. We now have um, a quick slideshow of artwork by other artists who took part in Creative Reactions this year. These will be available on this website that's about to come up now throughout May. And if you are keen on purchasing any of these pieces, um, do get in touch. There is a form on their website. Well, this brings us to the end of our show this evening. Thank you all very much for joining us today. We hope you've had a good evening. A very, very special thank you to all of our artists participating in Creative Reactions. I want to extend a huge thank you to the production team, Kamal, Karen, and Angeliki, who've been working really hard behind the scenes to put this evening together. Um, there is a form that you can fill up. There's a feedback form, um, which enters you into a prize draw to win some Pint of Science merch. So make sure you do that. Um, thank you once again for signing in and watching us this evening. Hopefully see you again next year. Have a lovely evening. Bye.